What a great time to be a Giant, be a fan of the Giants. But we have something going here. We're building something special, and you know you can see it from the outside and inside. It's even more beautiful. Reflecting on everything that got me here, just to see that uniform, and you know I, I watched. That's the team I watched the most growing up. My dad was a Giants fan, so once a Giant, always a Giant. For me, it's only a Giant. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of All In with Art Stapleton, a New York Giants podcast brought to you by NorthJersey.com and The Record. I am your host, Art Stapleton, and it is Buffalo weekend, and the Giants are, in a word, hurting. Daniel Jones has been ruled out for Sunday night's game. That means Tyrod Taylor will quarterback against his old team. Tommy DeVito, as I wrote last week, one snap away, the undrafted rookie from North Jersey, Fought his way to stay on the practice squad, and now he will more than likely be elevated this weekend, whether that's added to the active roster or just a game day elevation from the practice squad to back up Tyrod Taylor. The Giants had an option to maybe bring in a veteran quarterback. They may do that moving forward. A guy like Matt Barkley was an interesting name. Spent time with Brian Dable up in Buffalo. Knows the system to a point. He is a free agent. uh, But the Giants did not go down that road. So it will be DeVito as the backup. And boy, this game in the beginning of the season certainly had a heck of a lot more fanfare attached to it. More excitement up in Orchard Park under the lights. Brian Dable homecoming. Joe Shane returning to the franchise. Uh, and you know Josh Allen versus Daniel Jones. That is not going to happen. The Giants are 14-point underdogs, and I'm sure that spread will increase by kickoff on Sunday night. But we do have a good episode today of the show. Devin McCourty, 13-year veteran in the NFL, three-time Pro Bowler, three-time Super Bowl champion for the New England Patriots. Played his high school ball in Jersey at St. Joe's Montvale. Uh, went to Rutgers, obviously. Devin is a rookie on the media landscape. He is on the pregame show of the most watched television show in America, and that is Sunday Night Football. Football Night in America, it's Devin McCourty, Chris Sims, who we all know so well, and Jason Garrett who the Giants know so well. Those three guys, the Jersey guys, I'll have a story on that in the future about them getting together with Maria Taylor and forming a new team of their own. But Devin was nice enough to join me, and we talked a variety of topics. This was before Daniel Jones was officially ruled out for the game on Sunday night. But I think you really enjoyed Devin's perspective. Uh, He actually spent time with the Giants this summer, came to training camp, Uh, was there, and that's kind of where we started the interview, is just the idea of when you saw the Giants this summer, was there any way you anticipated them turning into this, a 1-4 team now staring right at 1-5 going into primetime against Buffalo? So tell me, you know, you were here this summer a little bit at the Giants camp, uh, and I know it may have just been a one, you know, a one-off one day to kind of catch up. But um, back then, when you're watching the team and kind of getting a sense of where they're at, I assume preparing for the season, did you ever envision something like this happening for them? And I mean, you know, this league, your 13 year, you know, pro. I mean, you know how things can go from up to down very quickly. But is this is this something that you could have foreseen back when you spent some time here at, at 1925 Giants Drive? No, not at all. And I think and I think the good thing about the time that I was there, what I realized was the team's kind of culture and energy that they had. It was a it was kind of a Friday tempo practice. So, um, you know, you couldn't see it wasn't true competition with those guys going after each other. But just being around everybody, talking to, to Xavier McKinney and Saquon Barkley and like the energy and then obviously with Dayball, I think what he brings is kind of that player-led, you know, you take ownership of the team. This is your team. You guys decide. So I think when you have that, even though it's not going well right now, um, even like, you know, going into Miami, obviously 
you know, you look at that game, they're like, they're way overmatched. They're going on the road. They're down in Miami. And what, like all those other things. And that game obviously didn't start well, but it was still competitive where they were able to, you know, get some key turnovers. And I think they're starting to take steps. I heard Dexter Lawrence say, like, we talked about going into the game, turning the ball over, getting turnovers. We did that, but then we gave up the chunk plays, the long runs, the big pass plays. And I think as you, you kind of take that down and try to bring that back, um, I think this team can start winning. Will they make the playoffs after starting like this would be tough. But I think when you can start to play better and get going, it can help you going forward where it's just not like total, you know, four games that we won all year. Like that, I think that takes a, a toll on a team. But I think they can still kind of semi-turn this around so it's not just the worst season ever. Dev, take me inside the locker room a little bit, and you just kind of shed a little bit of light on that. But I was curious as I was thinking about getting the chance to talk to you. You know, you were – you are one of the best leaders to come through the program up there in New England. You know, Bill Belichick always joked, you know, you're Mr. Patriot, you know, 13 years, three Super Bowls. I mean, what you've done there as a player. I thought a couple of weeks ago, and I thought it was interesting, is that, you know, the leadership could take on many forms. And Dable has 10 captains this year. But I think people lose sight of the fact that sometimes you need captains to, that do different things every year. And to me, this team, what it's lacking is kind of those players in the locker room to hold other guys accountable. And sometimes that's hard for guys uh, early on in their careers. From your perspective, when you were you know, a captain and a leader in a team, how does that manifest itself through the years uh, from one season to the next of how you have to lead to kind of pull the best out of your teammates and yourself? Yeah, man, I was very fortunate. The first year I was a captain was in my second year. So I got to learn from Vince Wolfer, Gerard Mayo, Logan Mankins, Brady, and all of those guys were all different. And I think what I was starting to learn was you have to see who you are in that room. And, you know, after a while when Vince and those guys left, I was kind of, you know, with Matt Slater, we kind of turned into the captains of the captains. And, you know, I love Tom in there. Uh, for the time before he left as well. Uh, yes, we're captains and, you know, we're all here as captains together, but we got to kind of be the person in the locker room that the locker room needs at any given time. Like, we can't just be like, this is my personality, this is my style, this is who I am. Like, once you get guys that are leaders that have been there for, you know, a long time, and even if you haven't been there for a long time, you have to look around the room and say, all right, we lost this with this leadership. This guy's gone. So when Tom left, all right, we lost a perfect example day in and day out of what to be. So all right, now none of us can be Brady, but we have to take turns kind of being that example and being able to push guys further. So I think in that locker room, those guys have to kind of look at each other and say, hey, a couple of us got to be uncomfortable. You know, this might not be our comfort zone, but we got to now do whatever it takes to get this team back on track. And I don't know what that is in their locker room, but they're going to need, you know, two, maybe three guys to step a little bit more out of their comfort zone to go and challenge the team and challenge different guys. Sometimes challenge the coaches to push and to do things differently if you want to turn it around. That's interesting. That's a that's a great point. So you go into Sunday night. Now you have your new team. So let's talk about a little bit about that. And then we'll get back to the game with, you know, we, we love the Jersey flavor down here and you're an adopted Jersey son. And I know now you spend a lot of time in, in North Jersey. I'm not even sure if you're still making your home here. Uh, but yep, I am. okay. So you know, you and Jason Garrett and some guy named Sims, you know, obviously Chris <laughs> Sims, uh, we all know the three Jersey guys in the, in the studio. How has that come together for your new team? And what's it been like for you to kind of go week to week? And is there, is the transition from a player to a, you know, a media person as big of a transition as some people like to say it is in terms of criticizing guys and telling people what it's like and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, man, for one, I would say it's been awesome. I think, you know, obviously as a new guy and then I was joining something that had already been established, I didn't kind of know how I was going to fit in and, you know, get in there. And, you know, obviously I had a relationship with Chris Sims already playing against Matt in high school. 
And then Chris was a scout for a little while in New England, so we would always talk. So having him first and foremost was awesome. The jokes, the laughs, talking about Jersey football, bringing up guys from the past, uh, all of those different things. And then with JG, with Jason Garrett coming in, and like I'm starting to talk about it, and like he's jumping right in, like Bergen and Bosco and St. Joe's, and you know, obviously being you know a player and then coaching in New York and then going to Princeton. It was just awesome uh, to be able to talk about those things. And then with Maria, like, she's just like, you know, the kind of Magic Johnson or, you know, John Stockton to our group of always setting everybody up. And she called me early on when I first got the job and told me that, like, my job is to help you as much as possible. So uh, all of us in the studio has been so cool. Um, and then we're always talking, you know, Jersey football, high school football, because that's where it's at. Like, we love talking about it. And, Excited this week to see my guy, St. Joe's, play Bird. And um, so, you know, I think it, it's still following that, still having that kind of, you know, continuity in a group, in a team setting. Uh, that's been great for me. And I think, for me, I don't always see it as like that jump to criticizing players. I think it's just talking ball and talking the game. And, you know, I think it's been fun for me to try to not just, you know, you turn on the film and, you know, you're like, all right, this guy's not playing well. But, like, sometimes there's so many other things that go into that. So it's watching to see, all right, like, what is this guy probably being coached to do? And then if I know coaches that are coaching places that I've been, like, I know that guy's being coached to do. So talking about it from that standpoint and not just telling, you know, a guy misses a block. Like, anybody can stand on TV and say, yeah, he missed a block. But it's actually talking about scheme, what they're being coached to do, like I said, why, you know, maybe the technique they're using isn't working against a certain player. All those different things, I see it as very informative and, and fun to talk about it. And I don't see it as much of, like, criticizing guys. Like, it is what it is. I've been criticized. You know, you get coached up all, every day that you're out there playing. So I just try to add that aspect and, and take fans into the kind of locker room and the meeting room of what coaches will tell players. Or sometimes even, you know, as a player of, like, hey, man, this is really bad coaching. Um, and, and I love kind of talking about that because you don't always see that when you watch TV and, and watch people analyze the game. When you've got your game in a game week now, uh, I mean, I know you were a film fiend when you played. How much film work do you do preparing for the game? Because your show, you know, Football Night in America is not just about the one game. I mean, obviously it has the pregame uh, element, but also you've got all the games throughout the entire day. Take me inside your prep work a little bit. How much do you break down of the two teams that are going to be playing on Sunday Night Football? Uh, that that's the biggest difference. Uh, like before, I'm watching an offense, you know, play, you know, six, seven games throughout the week. I'm watching all their games, but I'm just watching the offense. You know, I'm watching, you know, what defense is like. I would go on as a player and say, all right, who plays a similar defense to us? What style? Like who has similar safeties uh, or how they play? I would go watch that. So it was very kind of pinpoint. This is what I want to see. I watch third down cutups on the offense red zone. Now, I'm just like all over the place. First, we get our game. I'll start off the week breaking down our game, you know, what the offense looks like, what the defense, and I'll actually break it down to the standpoint of, all right, this is what they need to do to win, or this is what they do well that I'll, I enjoy watching, or this is something that they don't do well. So I'll break that down for the two teams. So this week of Buffalo and, and the Giants. And then it's going back through, you know, the other games that I'll try – to watch like the condensed versions of the games and say, all right, here's three key things for the week for this team, this team, and this team and go across the board for those two teams. And then now uh, I'm actually calling a game this week. I'm calling on uh, Westwood one. I'm calling the Kansas city Denver game. Huh. So I'm also breaking down their games. So it, it's been fun and I don't, I don't have a full slate of games. So I'm not each week having to break down all of those games. But it's been fun diving back into the film, and I, I think it helps you stay relevant of schemes and different things. Like you turn on San Francisco and Miami, the motions, the different things that they're doing. That's not that's not the football that I came into the league doing. I still got some of it at the end of my career, but it's good to stay on top of that and see how they're running things. Um, so I would say I'm probably watching more film, and I would say 
a more variety of film and, and different study habits than I did when I was playing. You know, it's funny you mentioned San Francisco and Miami. I was talking to the Giants defensive backs coach, Jerome Henderson, who's been in the league for a long time, uh-huh. uh, a couple weeks ago after the 49ers game. And he said, you know, as a DB in this league now, which obviously you can speak to in your experience, you have the blueprint, the NFL teams that are kind of the blueprint, the traditional, you know, we're going to yeah. man up, we're going to play it straight. And then when you get to preparing for a team like San Francisco or Miami, you almost have to throw the blueprint out and just learn the defense from ground zero. Have you seen that? And how much of a challenge is it? I'll take it to the Giants when you have a young secondary, you have rookie corners, you have guys who right now are kind of struggling a little bit across, you know, three levels. How much of a challenge was it last week, do you think, against Miami when they get hit with all that stuff that they kind of have to learn really in a short week as well coming off of Monday Night Football? Yeah, it's hard. It's the intricate things. Like Miami, the complexity and and what they do of a simple thing for a corner, if a guy has a, you know, he has a, a cut split where he's closer to the tight end or tackle area than usual, not out around the numbers, like, when you're a corner, you're like, I want to press. Sometimes you play against a team like Miami, you can't, like, we, you can't press right now because they're going to motion somebody, the safety might need to come down. Like, corners are not always thinking about that. So, like, those are little tiny things. And then the, the long pass they gave up um, to Tyreek Hill, I'm watching the play, and I actually like the call they were in. They were in a third down call. They went three-man rush. They ended up, instead of having a one-three guy, you know, like a one robber concept. They go double robber and put a guy in the middle of the field. But really what they needed there was they needed the middle of the field safety to dare um, Tua to throw the nine route or to throw the deep ball to Braxton Barrios on the other side and just stand right over top of Tyreek Hill. And that was something that I learned later in my career from watching Ed Reed. Ed Reed would move all the way over on one side of the field and just say, hey, I dare you to throw over here, and then I'm going to just take off full speed to the other side. And I used to talk to Brady, and Brady used to say that was the hardest way to play him. Like, if a guy played in the middle of the field, he knew he could look him off and throw it. But if a guy stayed on a side, it was harder because he said, I would have to kind of play chicken with him and and see Mm. if I could hold him and then throw it. Or if I really throw it over there, and he's standing over there, it's such a bad read by me. So when I saw that play, I was like, for a guy like Jason Pinnock, like he, he hasn't been out there a ton. So, you know, they're all prepared for all of the Miami stuff, the motions. And that play was just wide splits on one side with Tyreek Hill and short and cut splits on the other side. All he had to do was just move over. And it's like, all right, man, I kind of missed that. But against Miami, <laughs> missing that is a 70-yard touchdown. Yeah. So I think those are the small, intricate things that they'll continue to learn as they play football and play together. So speak to Giants fans a little bit right now. You, you've broken down the film to this point. I'm sure you'll still do more film work over the weekend. Can you make a case for this game being competitive on Sunday night? Obviously, I'm sure for your bosses, too. They don't want eyeballs moving away from Sunday night football. <laughs> um, can, can the Giants compete? Do you see things on film that if they can you know, stay healthy, maybe get a couple guys back this weekend, that they can be in this game with Buffalo up in Orchard Park? I think so. I think I think the biggest thing is Buffalo. Buffalo's hurt right now. Like they have a lot of injuries. You know, if uh, if um, I forgot the corner's name in Buffalo, but if he doesn't come back this week, you know, Elam struggled a little bit. They took him out last last week. They pulled up a guy from the practice squad who kind of played over him. So you lose Matt Milano. Um, they they're they're banged up. Daquan Jones is probably going to be out for a while. So you're now going against a team where Bob Miller kind of put his toe in the water. So maybe, you know, offensively, you now have a chance where this pass rush might not be as dynamic if Vaughn is still on a kind of a pitch count of not playing as many snaps. So I think the key for the Giants is, like, let's not fall behind. We're now we're in five-man protections where you only have the five guys blocking. So now if anybody gets beat, it's tough. Like, let's keep the game, you know, where – Hopefully we can go and jump out and get up seven zip or get out seven to three. Or now we're playing on our terms and we're not playing from behind how they've been playing. Um, and I think the key thing for them is let's just not let the ball over our heads. You know, let's not let Diggs or Gabe Davis get behind us and we can just make them drive the field and then just be opportunistic to get some turnovers um, to start the game, especially 
that I think can help keep the game competitive. And I think we've seen in this league, if you keep the game close, you have a chance to win it. I thought Jacksonville did a good job of that last week against Buffalo. I was just doing what they were doing. They were able to run the ball and they were able to control the game for the most part. And then you're not playing from behind where now you're getting these exotic blitzes or these exotic fronts. And now you're trying to block and communications key. And then, you know, protect Daniel Jones, like getting hit 28 times in two games. Like you have no shot to play quarterback. So I think keeping it close and, and playing from ahead will help them do that. You know, you know, Wink Martindale's defense and you know, Josh Allen, obviously you've played Josh Allen heads up twice a year for, I guess it for his entire career, basically. Um, yeah. is, are there things that the Giants can do defensively uh, especially with the knowledge a little bit. I mean, I don't know if that matters, but, you know, look, Dable, Dable was up there. I mean, yeah. Dable was there from, from when Josh Allen began, so I would imagine he knows all his strengths and all his weaknesses. Um, do you look at that as a defensive player going into a game like this, saying, you know what, as good as that quarterback is, we've got to find things that, that maybe he doesn't do as well and kind of try to exploit that? Yeah, you know, no doubt. When we played Tom in 2021, we lost – I think it was about one point or something. But he had a tough game against us because all the things that he would talk to Josh McDaniels about that he hated, we know. <laughs> we know all those things that so you're going to do. it. so all the things that, you know, I'm sure Dable and Josh Allen used to talk about um, in those meeting rooms of like, man, when they do this and what, like, that's what the Giants will do. Like, that's what you have to do as a defense. So, like, one of the key things I know Wade Martindale is a, you know, kind of exotic blitz package – like, if Dable comes in and says, hey, like, Josh used to eat those things up because when he sees it, he now knows where the blitz is coming from. He's going to just take off in the opposite B-gap and run. All right, like, let's not, let's not do those things. So I think they have a head start just from a, a coaching standpoint and game plan standpoint of, all right, let's keep in and run the things that he doesn't like. Let's do those things. What are the things that frustrate Stephon Diggs? Is double teaming him early in the game and not letting them get touches and frustrating them. Is that a key to kind of blowing up that whole thing on the sideline? All right, let's do. So those little tiny details and things that you could do from a game plan standpoint, I think can help them out, you know, tremendously if they're able to do it. I think the biggest thing is, you know, in a week like this, you're playing against a team that is a juggernaut and they get going, they're hard to stop. How can we put in a game plan during the week, but most importantly, execute that game plan on Sunday night? is, I think, going to be the key to the to the team. You can have a great game plan, but what are you going to do the first time, you know, Josh Allen breaks the pocket and he gets a 25, 30-yard game? Are you going to stick to the game plan or are you going to say it's not? Like, those are the things, I think, as a team, when you're not when you're not playing well one win, that you, you can't let those things seep into your mind in the middle of a game. You got to just stick to the game plan. As a defensive player, we always hear uh, about Saquon Barkley and his presence when you watch the Giants' offense on film since he's been out, do you, speaking from your experience, if he can go on Sunday night and he's close to as 100% as he can be, does that change perspective? Does it change, you know, does it put you on your heels a little bit? Tell me about the idea of when you play a back like that in this league. I know running backs don't matter to a lot of people, but I would imagine for defensive players, a back like that could kind of put you on your heels a little bit and make you think uh, maybe before you act. Oh yeah, running backs, they only don't matter when it's time to pay them. Uh, every, <laughs> everybody knows, you know, especially a guy like Saquon Barkley, He's just so versatile. He can do everything. It's hard, he's hard to tackle. Um, you know, I remember when we played them in 2019, we're watching the film because we played them in the preseason and we weren't playing and Bill wanted us to get ahead. And we're watching the film and I'm like, yo, this guy is out. I mean, spin moves in the hole, then take two more steps and jump over. You're just like, wow. But I think the key is he has to be able to go. He can't, you know, you can't, you can't send him out there and say like, hey, He's going to help us no matter what because he got, because as a defensive player, we always said if a guy came off an injury, we'll see how the first quarter goes. If he's himself, like we're going to game plan for him. If he's himself, then we know what we got to do and we got to stick to the game plan. But if he's not himself, then we're going to change up the game plan, make our adjustments, and go from there. So I think for him to really help the Giants, you know, more than just the first quarter, he has to be healthy and ready to go. Not just, I think sometimes fans are like, just put him out there at 70% like that. There's no such thing. Like, can you be the player that, you know, you can be out there or not? If you can't, 
then like you're hurting the team because we rather have another guy active that can go and help us and go for 60 minutes than having, you know, Saquon come out there, he's 60 or 70 percent, then he gets one hit, and now he's 40 percent, now he's on the sideline. Like that doesn't help the team. So he has to definitely be healthy enough to go and be able to do what he can do and be effective on the field. I think to really help the team. You know, we'll see how things play out with Daniel Jones if he's going to go with it with this neck injury. I mean, we're we're talking now just the idea. You know, practices later today, so we'll find out. So it's either Daniel Jones or Tyrod Taylor. But we all mentioned Jersey football in the beginning, so I have to come back to that. You know, there is a chance that Tommy DeVito uh, from North Jersey and a Bosco guy might be out there as the emergency quarterback on Sunday night. So it'll give you kind of an opening to talk about Bosco and talk your smack. Uh, hopefully Joe's wins this weekend for you and you got Joe's Bergen. I mean, you could bring that to the forefront on Sunday night. Yeah, man, he would be poised and ready to go if he was from St. Joe's. But, you know, even being from Bosco, he still have a chance out there. But, you know, I think it'll be interesting. I think there's nothing better than that. A guy, you know, you played at Don Bosco, and he might have a chance to be out there, you know, Sunday night football representing for the New York Giants, where, I mean, I'm sure he might have grew up a Giants fan or Jets fan, whatever it is. Uh, but I'm sure he has a ton of family and friends that are Giants fans. So, uh, to be able to represent that, you know, obviously in the preseason, it's cool, it's awesome. But if he was able to be out there Sunday night, I think it would be, you know, it would be really cool. But it would it would really matter if he was able to go out there Sunday night and play well and help the team win. It wouldn't have to be just, you know, a cool story. It would be a success story. So I know for Giants fans, they're hoping Daniel Jones is out there and he's able to stay healthy. And they're hoping he doesn't get hit. Um, and he can stay healthy no matter what. McCordy's taking over the media, Jason in the mornings and Dev on Sunday nights. Obviously, you also doing uh, the Westwood one on uh, KC on Thursday night against the Broncos, right? Yep. Yeah, we'll see if they can give up another 70. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, Dev, appreciate it as always, and uh, we'll be watching on Sunday night. I appreciate it. Right, good talking to you. Thanks, man. Thanks to Devin McCourty giving me a few minutes. And as I joked, you got Jason McCourty taking over the mornings on Good Morning Football and NFL Network. And then Devin taking over Sunday night and that spotlight in his rookie venture in the media. Both McCourty's are tremendous. They've always been that way going back to when I covered them in high school at St. Joe's, both in football and, as I joked, in basketball, the Bergen Jamboree. Uh, which if you're from North Jersey, there's nothing better than the Jambo uh, when you're covering high school football and basketball and all the other sports uh, that I spent uh, more than a decade covering uh, with the record. So always appreciate Devin McCourty, and uh, it's fun to kind of circle back to these stories. But I thought he had interesting perspective as to what's going on and the Giants heading into uh, Sunday night. Um, you know, and we know the quarterback situation, something to keep an eye on now is the offensive line. What happens on this offensive line now? Uh, Andrew Thomas is out. John Michael Schmitz is out. Matt Parrott has a shoulder injury. He is out. Uh, coming out of last week's game, Joshua Zudu had a really rough going again at left tackle. Uh, he was left in tears in the locker room after the game. Just the weight of the expectation of having to fill in for Andrew Thomas, uh, being the one who whiffed on the block that ended up uh, Andrew Van Ginkle hurting Daniel Jones with a blindside sack. Uh, you know, I think the Giants have no other choice than to put Azudu back at left tackle. Uh, you hope they've been able to help him and encourage him and get him uh, kind of out of that emotional funk that he's had the last two games. Uh, but, you know, you really feel for a kid. But look, this is professional football. You know, zudu has got to find a way to work his way out of it. Uh, Yadni Kajust, who just signed, the Giants, uh, signed with the Giants officially on Wednesday on the practice squad, was released with an injury designation from the Jets in the summer, he might be the guy who starts at right tackle or at least is up because Evan Neal suffered an ankle injury in practice on Thursday and his availability is in question for Sunday night. Uh, I think the only thing we know for sure 
is that Ben Bredesen will start at center. Mark Glowinski will probably start at left guard. My guess would be Marcus McKeithen starts at right guard, but McKeithen left the game last Sunday in Miami with a knee injury. So if Glowinski has to slide back to right guard, does that mean that the Giants find a way to get Justin Pugh up on game day? Now, in talking to Justin Pugh earlier this week, I still think he's about a week away. Uh, he viewed coming here and being on the practice squad as kind of a, an acclimation period, trying to to get back into football. Uh, so I do think that when it comes to Pugh, I think the biggest issue is if if he were playing any other position, he'd be active on Sunday night because you'd say, okay, give me 20 snaps. But when you're playing on the offensive line, if you say, give me 20 snaps, you now need to have an option to be able to play the other 30 snaps on offense, given the idea that you're probably playing around 50 snaps on offense, uh, give or take, you know, maybe plus 10, minus 10, however it is. Um, so could Justin Pugh gut it out and could the Giants look at it if McKeithen is unavailable to go and they don't if they don't want to play Jalen Mayfield again at right guard uh, and they don't want to push Jalen Thomas into action at any other position besides backing up Bredesen at center could the Giants go Pugh at left guard yeah, but I think that's a lot to ask. I really do. A guy coming off an ACL, he is one day shy of one year from when he tore that ACL. And there's a big difference between Justin Pugh and where he's at and, say, Wondell Robinson, who spent the entire offseason in his rehab with the Giants. So, you know, the fact that he came back nine months after, still, he was working with the Giants. He was working in a training capacity with this team Justin Pugh was not so it's going to be a lot to watch on Sunday night um, we will not have game day podcast this week uh, but we will return back with podcast next week and uh, back to full-time coverage so again I hope you enjoyed this show and uh, we'll reset after Buffalo and see where the Giants are at uh, Devin McCourty gave you the idea of how the Giants could come out there and stun the Bills on Sunday night. Let's see if that comes from to fruition or if that's just wishful thinking. I'm guessing it's the latter uh, as this team continues to find its way, uh, struggling through an unexpected, terrible, terrible start to year two of Brian Dable and Joe Shane and what this team is trying to accomplish. Can the Giants turn a corner? We'll be watching. Let's see what happens. As always, we're all in. We appreciate you being all in, too.